natural philosophers viewed the earth as separate from the heavens. The Greeks even had a concept that it was made of different things, different from the earth, fire, and air, and water that we have on earth, something, a perfect element called quintessence. Well, at the dawn of the Enlightenment, great thinkers, including Copernicus, Galileo, and Newton, realized what the place of Earth is among the heavens. But it took until one Christmas Eve, a mere 45 years ago, where humans first were viewed our planet as a distant world from the vicinity of another world. And this image shows the view that the Apollo 8 astronauts took of Earth with the moon in the foreground a few minutes after they had first captured that view with their own eyes. Now you see in this image two very different worlds. In the foreground is our moon, a gray, airless, foreboding world. And in the distance, the shining orb of Earth, blue oceans, continents, clouds, an inviting place, the place where we and our ancestors have lived for not just generations, but billions of years. It isn't the only world in the universe. We've known that for centuries. But is it the only world which is suitable for life to live and flourish? Is it the only really great environment? Now, back when that Apollo image was taken, the only planets we knew of were those orbiting our sun. Yet there was a great diversity in those planets. From little airless Mercury to giant Jupiter and Saturn made of hydrogen and helium primarily, the same major elements in our sun. Gases, fluids, without solid surfaces on which life could walk. Well, in the past couple decades, we've discovered thousands of worlds outside of our solar system, thousands of other planets. But the question is still there. Are there other Earths? Are there other environments where life can develop and thrive? Five years ago, NASA launched the Kepler spacecraft. And Kepler's mission was designed to look at one area of the sky near the plane of our Milky Way galaxy, stare at about 150,000 stars continuously for four years recording their light from each of these stars every 30 minutes to see little patterns of dips representing transits, partial eclipses that we see when planets that are orbiting those stars pass between us and their stellar disks once every time they orbit, once every year on those planets. Now, Kepler only sees planets if their orbits are edge-on. So we can't detect most of them. But even so, we have discovered thousands of planetary candidates. Now, they're just candidates because these little patterns of dips, they can also come if you have an eclipsing 
binary star near in the sky to our target star. And they're very difficult to discern. So majority remain candidates, but we found that when we investigate them in great detail, at least 90% of them are going to turn out to be planets. And because of the number of planet candidates we've seen, and the fact that we can only see them edge on, we've derived that there's an average of at least one planet per star. And there are 200 billion stars in our galaxy. So there are hundreds of billions, perhaps even a trillion planets within our galaxy. But planets are incredibly diverse. They range in mass by over a factor of 10,000. They go from small, airless worlds primarily made of iron to giant gas balls made primarily of the lightest elements in our universe, hydrogen and helium. When you think of diversity, an image like this may come to mind. But people, well, were really nowhere near as diverse as planets. A better analogy would be to think about the diversity of the animal kingdom. And even that isn't really there yet. Think more animals, plants, fungi, and now you're getting the idea of how planets, how diverse planets are. We have four giant planets in our solar system. Most of their volume is hydrogen and helium. Below that, if there is any solid surface, it's under crushing pressures and enormous temperatures. Nothing like the conditions that even that anyone could imagine surviving in. Everything would melt. It's just not the place where you could live. And extrasolar planets, the ones we're familiar with, are even more diverse. Now, this image, which represents the first few dozen planets found by Kepler, shows many worlds bigger than Jupiter and only one smaller than Earth. That's actually because the big worlds are the easier ones to find. And now that we've had more chance to study the data, we're finding more and more smaller planets. They're quite common. Another thing may be apparent in this image is that the planets are just represented by colored balls. They're not the pretty pictures that you saw earlier and that you've probably seen on TV or the internet. But this is more real because we don't know very much about these planets. In most cases, all we know is either the physical size or the mass plus something about its orbit. Now in a few cases, we know we've been able to measure both the size and the mass. And by comparing the size and the mass, we know the density. And therefore, we have an idea of what these planets are made of. And again, there's a tremendous diversity. Many are made of very light elements. There are some that are primarily rocky, like our Earth. But these are all fairly small worlds 
no more than about 50 or 60 percent larger in size than the planet which we inhabit. So we have a huge number of planets, but a huge range of properties. How big they are, what they're made of, and where they are. Some are roasting right near their stars. Some are so far away, the star that they orbit is not much brighter than the other stars in the sky and providing very little energy. They have different magnetic fields, they have different rotations, they have different this, they have different that. And it's not just their star, it's the rest of their environs that can be different. Because from what we've been seeing, most planets aren't the only planet around their star. Most planets have neighbors. And indeed, we found some very interesting planetary systems. Kepler-11 has six planets, all orbiting close to their star. They range from about twice the size of Earth to about four times the size of Earth. Five of them orbit closer to their star than any planet orbits to our sun, and the other is not much more distant from its star than Mercury is from our sun. We have Kepler-42, tiny star, and three planets roughly the size of Earth. But with orbital periods, their years are less than two days. So even though they have a dim fire, they're huddled so close to it, it's roastingly hot. And then there are planets like those in the Kepler-16 system, Kepler-16b. It's a Saturn-like planet. It's not one of the habitable type. But it has an environment that some planets that are habitable may have. It orbits not one but two stars. And two stars that look actually quite different. One's a yellow star, a little bit fainter than our sun, and one's much fainter, red, much smaller red star. Now, it's not just the stars that can affect the planets. Other planets can change the properties of a planet's rotation and orbit. Even though Earth doesn't have any big, close neighbors, the ice ages that we ex have experienced in the history of Earth are due to perturbations of the other planets. And even little things like asteroids, even a medium-sized asteroid can come in and do a lot of damage. And I defy you to find any dinosaur who will disagree with that statement. <laughs> now, I've been talking about planets and skirting the ideas of life. But what does life need? Well, at its fundamental essence, life needs energy, and energy in usable form, not just heat. Plus, it needs chemistry and a non-uniform type of chemistry, more of a stew than a homogenized soup. And the best environments we have on Earth are at the interface of air and sunlight, water, and land. Either land that you can stand on or right under the surface of the water. There are all sorts of environments, as long as they have liquid water, that can have simple microbes, but have a thriving biosphere to have development of very complex life, you need these ingredients. And we can look at our solar system. And there's kind of a habitability test. It has a lot of questions. And 
for habitability of complex life, a really good environment, we know that all of the other worlds orbiting our sun fail this test. Do any other worlds anywhere pass? There are two that we found that might. One discovered about a year ago, Kepler 62F. It's about 40% larger than Earth, so it's at a size where it could possibly be rocky. We've seen rocky planets that big. It stars a little smaller than the Sun, and it gets about half the energy Earth receives. So this really brings up a big question. Is this extra size, more atmosphere, maybe more greenhouse, allowing more heating to compensate for the less energy? There are a lot of questions on this test. If you can get a little bit off on one and you get a little off on the other, maybe you can pass. That's a big issue because the other one we've seen, a little closer in size to Earth, a little less energy orbiting a star a little less different. This one was found only about 10 days ago. Kepler 186F, Earth's cousin. So the real question is, will only an Earth twin pass the habitability test? Is only an Earth twin suitable for life to form and develop? If so, even with hundreds of billions of planets in our galaxy, it's likely to be a very lonely place. But if there are a variety of good habitats, a variety of interesting life, the galaxy may be teeming with life. We may not be alone. We may have many neighbors. And then when we know the answer to this question, we'll really be able to place our planet and ourselves in the context of the broader universe. Thank you.